Hey guys, how's it going? It's Ray here. Today I want to talk about another map, and that map is Brax's Holdout. Brax's Holdout is a two-lane map, one of only three, the other two being Haunted Mines and Battlefield of Eternity. So what I want to cover today is kind of the meta strategy and how you should be playing this map. This map differs quite a lot from rotation maps, so I think this map is the longest laning phase in the game. And what I mean by that is you're going to be staying with your team in lane longer than any other map. What I want to cover today is what kind of drafts you, could go, you should cover and where you should be on the map and how you should be laning. This is a replay I have from a tournament. It's not the highest level game, but it is a tournament game and both teams are trying and both teams have drafted prior to this. So I'm in comms with my team and I just want to go over kind of and highlight the areas that we kind of push for on the map and why we do them and why we want to go to certain spots. So in terms of comps, you can see that the, the lane here is very short. Now, most teams just go bot, but you can see that bot here is not the same as top. So if you look at bot side, this, this point here is closer to the left side. And if you look at top, this the point is closer to the right side. So I think that if you're formatting uh, on this map, it's better to be on the side where your point is closer to your side. So as I said, formatting, right? So it's going to be 4-1 is generally the split, pretty much the same as all two lane maps. And the reason for this is if you do 3-2 and then the team does 4-1, their 4 is going to push harder than, um, so if the 4 matches the 3, their 4 man is going to push harder than their 2 man will push against your 1 man. And if you do any other kind of rotation, it's just, it works out so that 4 will always be more dominant than the 1 person. So 4 people can easily push 3, but 2 cannot easily push 1, basically the how you can look at it. So because these lanes are so short, it allows heroes uh, like Medic um, and good range poke heroes to be very effective because they're very hard to kill because they're so close in lane. Now, of course, the laning phase doesn't last the entire game, but it does last a decent chunk of the game. And it's going to last for at least a few minutes early game. So you're basically going to be staying in lane. So when the objective spawns, I mean, the objective is right here in your four men. So you're going to want to stay right on the objective when it spawns. You're going to want your top lane to stay top lane when it spawns. So the camps on this map spawn at 2 minutes for the siege camps and 2 minutes and 30 seconds for the knights. I'll cover the, the camps a little bit more when they spawn, but in essence you want to get them when you're either not doing anything uh, while, while you're trying to cap this and it'll help pressure the lane, or you want to get them after one of these points have been capped and the zerg is pushed in. So the zerg, well it's obviously the main objective on this map and if you get it it's going to be able to, you're going to push quite hard with it. So let's cover the heroes that can push with it a bit more and the heroes that are good against it. Wave clear is all obviously very good. Gul'dan is good in this map because he can clear the Zerg out very effectively. So you might think that wave clear is important. However, if you just focus on winning the shrine in the first place, you won't need to draft heroes that are required to defend against the Zerg wave. So if you just win the shrine, you can just push with it and you won't need to worry about it. Globals are obviously very effective on this map because you can lane with four. And if you, we have a foul set on our team here, and you'll see that he gets a lot of ganks top lane and pressures the their Alarak, who's going to be soloing, very effectively. He pretty much single-handedly wins us the early game, and that's just because of the global pressure that he has. So globals, so foul set, bright wing, and Dahaka are very strong in this map, but you don't want to have too many. ETC with stage dive is also good, as is medic with medevac. So. The early game, you're pretty much just going to be laning as four and going to the lane. So here, if we go, we want to go bot because we're left side and this vent is closer to our side. So this gives us more safety. Now the enemy team could go top, right? But the problem is that we have <clears throat> we have a foul set, a Li Ming, a medic, and a Zarya that will be four manning. So that four man pushes harder than their Johanna, Lunara, Gul'dan, and Ariel. So since we push harder. And we can push very effectively because Zarya is just obviously very strong versus sieging. They don't want to, they want to make sure that they're matching us so that we can't push against them. Now our comp is, we have a medic and medic is very hard to get to in laning phase. And is one of the strongest heroes in this map, especially support wise. So we're still able to push them very effectively. However, we aren't able to get as much siege as we'd like to. So in the early game, as you'll see when I start the replay, there's not much that's going to be happening. So 
we try to just push the lane, but we're not trying to, if, if we're not able to get a kill, if we're not able to do something, that's fine. We still keep laning until something does happen. And what happens is Falstead is able to get ganks. That means he's able to get pressure top and they get XP deficits. So solo laning is very important on this map. And it's very important to have a good solo laner. I mean, it's good to have a good solo laner on pretty much any map, um, such as Infernal Shrines, the solo lane's top, Tomb of the Spider Queen, the solo lane's bottom, Dragonshire, the solo lane's top, you get the idea. The solo lanes are very important in general, but especially on two lane maps, you really, really need your other lane not to die. And Braxis is not the easiest map to rotate through. So you're going to want to make sure that your solo lane is very safe. So some good solo laners are Alrak, Dahaka, Chen. Rexar is okay on this map, but I don't think he's the best pick. He's probably pretty decent in Hero League, but competitive-wise, he doesn't really see any play um, from what I've seen. So let's start the replay. So all we do early game is just we just head to lane and we just push. And you can see that Foul Side goes top immediately here. Because he has the global, he's either going to get some damage or a kill top lane, and then he can just fly bot. So we're not at a disadvantage at all here. And in fact, he ends up getting a kill, if I remember correctly. Yes, so Alarak dies early, and we get an easy XP lead, and then he can just fly bot to help us out. And as you can see here, they're not really able to push too much, especially with the Medic and Azaria. So they're trying to push in, nothing's able to happen and Falset comes back to our lane. So when the, he can spawn, uh, we obviously want to cap them as soon as possible. Jen is pretty good at holding top. Alarak can't really push him off, but Alarak does do pretty well versus Chen later on. So Falset's just going to keep looking for ganks, and we want to make sure that you have a win condition when you're playing on this map. Our win condition is very heavy sustain, good poke. So both Zarya and Li Ming have very effective poke, and then they have no way of getting to Medic here. So you can see that they have Johanna, Zanara, Gul'dan, and Ariel. And not, none of those heroes have good engage. And Medic is going to easily outheal any of that damage. So our win condition here is, is safety bot lane. And then our global that goes top. So in some other situations, you might have really, really good poke bottom lane. Or really good sustain. Or you might have... Uh, a ganking uh, lane as well. So you could potentially also just leave like one or two bot, one person top or something, and then have a gank squad. Maybe you have an ETC Tyrande. That just makes it so that the enemy team has to play very safe. And you're either going to want to get kills, or you're going to want to get siege, and that's eventually going to snowball to something where you can get the beacon. Just don't be rushed to get a kill. Don't be rushed to capture the beacon. As long as the team does, enemy team doesn't have both of these, there's a no rush to cap them. So you can see that two minutes that these camps spawn, and if you like, you can do, you can capture these. The beacons also spawn at two minutes, so that doesn't give you a lot of time to do both. So you want to make sure that you capture one or the other. So you just as long you can do the camp as long as you say if we're bot here, we can do this camp as long as we know that top is doing their camp, or if it's, as long as we know that we have top capped. Now, obviously. Uh, the, our, merc our night camp is not close to bottom lane. It's all the way up to the top left here. So that makes it pretty much impossible for us to do it because if we go top, uh, they're going to cap it. Now the enemy team on um, the right side can pretty much easily do their, their night camp, uh, or much more easily at least, as long as they're holding top. And we can do our, our siege camp here, but it isn't quite as effective. So the, knights camp the night camps on this map are very, very strong. They're the strongest night camp in the game. And they're also one of the most difficult cap, uh, caps to, camps to capture. So the siege camp has a very short range, and it's basically just going to push out the wave. It doesn't really kill anything. It doesn't really siege anything. And it's very e easy to capture, though. The night camp will actually get like a whole fort. It'll outrange towers. It'll outrange the fort. This is a very effective camp. They'll get very significant push, and it's something that you need to deal with. Now, there's also the boss in this map, which spawns at three minutes. And the boss is a unique boss to pretty much, I think it's, yeah, it's a unique, a unique boss. It doesn't happen on any other map, and it, it's a ranged boss. So it has a few attacks. It's going to attack in a straight line. It's going to spawn uh, little missile things. And basically, all you want to do when you're doing the boss is avoid the AoE, and you want to aggro it so that if we're on left side here, we want to make sure it's shooting towards the left side so that the enemy team doesn't see it, especially if we're trying to sneak it. So here, 
we capture bot lane after a little bit of a struggle and nothing too much happens. And I just want to go over uh, what we do when we actually have the Zerg pushing. Do you, we know ahead of time where the Zerg is going to spawn. Obviously here it spawns bottom. And over here it's going to, uh, the red team will have a bit of Zerg. But you can see that the amount of Zerg that they have is very, very insignificant. So we don't have to worry about top at all. In fact, what we'd like to do ideally is just leave Falstead top because he has the global and have our Chen come bottom lane. And then we just push bot with this wave. So if you don't have a global, it's not a big deal. Um, although it's definitely better to have a global. Uh, if they don't have a lot of push, I mean, you can just leave anyone top. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that you can't take a fight if they roam bot or if they have a global because they can roam on you 5v4 and kill your whole team, which would obviously be very bad. You want to make sure that as the Zerg are spawning, you play safe so that you aren't dying. and Because you, you definitely don't want to die as the Zerg spawns because that pretty much nullifies your entire advantage. So here we already have a level lead before the Zerg wave even comes out. And this is going to give us a huge snowball effect in the game. So in case you're unaware, um, you get certain types of Zerg at certain percentages. The most notable is that you get an Ultralisk at 50% and you get another Ultralisk at 100%. You also get additional Hydralisks, Corruptors, Banelings, and Zerglings at each stage as well. So the Zerg wave gets exponentially stronger as it goes on because of the way that uh, the math works out. So a 100% Zerg wave is exponentially stronger than a 50% Zerg wave because you, you know, 50% Zerg wave doesn't add on to all the, you won't have as many Corruptors and whatnot and Hydralisks. Uh, something else to note is that the Ultralisks, when they die, actually drop regeneration globes for the enemy team. So you want to make sure that you're zoning them very hard when you're pushing so they, don't, they aren't able to get those regeneration globes for free. Also, there's regeneration globes, as I said earlier, on both sides of the map. So that means if you're winning, you can win a little bit harder because you'll have access to these and you'll have control over these globes. These globes are very important over controlling your laning and controlling the laning phase as a whole. And it's important that you try to hold it for make sure your multiple members on your team are able to get the globes, especially if they have regeneration globe stacking effects. So here we just push bot. We try and zone them as much as possible. If we got this tower before, then this would have been an easy fort. But since we didn't get these towers, it's a little bit more of a siege for us. The last thing I really want to go over is that the corruptors here. Um, they outrange anything, and they, so forts won't be able to damage them, so they'll outrange, but they don't do that much damage. Um, so something that you might not know is that the Zerg wave spawns two minutes, uh, or the, the beacons will activate two minutes after that the last Zerg dies. So you can see that we cleared out all of their Zerg, and we still have three Corruptors here. So these three Corruptors, when they die, when all three die, then... Uh, the beacons will become active exactly two minutes after the last corruptor dies. Now, if you're in their position, okay, if you're in the position of, of, of them here, you do not want to kill these corruptors. Okay, you want to leave one corruptor at very, very low health, and that's because none of the merc camps on the map will spawn until these corruptors are dead. So, if they kill these corruptors, we're immediately going to go do their we're immediately going to go do mercenary camps, and because they're a talent down, two levels down, they're not going to be able to contest us. So what they should be doing here is leaving these corruptors alive as long as possible, and just going to soak their lane until they hit level seven, so that they can contest mercenary camps. But they don't do that; they clear them, and we're able to just push up. Now, of course, we might siege here and get the fort anyway, even if they leave the corruptors up, but. It'll be a little bit slower, and uh, we won't have access to the mercenary camps, which we do here. So this map is pretty straightforward. Pretty much the only thing you want to remember is don't rush anything. Uh, if you get a kill, then you get a kill, and you can capture the beacons. Just make sure that you know you're not overcommitting. Don't get too scared. Enemy team is is capturing both beacons at the same time. Just take it carefully, because if you wipe on that, then they're going to get the Zerg wave. So get, if they get a few percent, it's not a big deal. You just want to make sure that you don't rush, you don't die, and you always want to look for ganks top. So if you're the, the solo line up here, you want to make sure that above anything else, you just don't die. That's exponentially worse than uh, just if, if you can't get the capture point, just don't go for the capture point. Because if you die, then you're gonna your team's going to lose half the experience on the map. Plus, you're going to lose a fort because you have no one else here to defend it. 
So try and look for globals, try and look for ganks, make sure you do merc camps, make sure you push with the wave, and that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, let me know, and until next time, thanks for watching.